from Dr. Joy. You can start. Dr. Joy, you can start. Dr. Joy, can you hear me? I'll be presenting. I'll be presenting question one of the West African uh, College of Phys Physicians, two thousand and twenty-one, and it says a young lady with a drug reaction. He gave a picture of a young lady signifying a drug reaction um, with dress syndrome. So the first question was, type of reaction is this? The second question, what is the the hallmark of diagnosis. The third one was the list, list the diagnostic criteria. Then the fourth question was to list predispos predisposing factors to the condition. Then the fifth question was to outline the clinical features, then list four classes of drugs that can cause this, then outline the management. Now, the type of reaction is known to be a severe cutaneous adverse reaction. And it's a, a drug-induced type 4 um, hypersensitivity reaction. Um, for the question, the answer to question 2 talks about the hallmark of diagnosis, which is fever greater than 38 uh, centigrade. Then usually patients present with a mobiliform um, rash, eruption, progressing to confluent and infiltrated erythema, or with some form of exfoliative um, dermatitis involving the more than 90% of the total body area. Then there could be systemic involvement involving the liver, the kidney, the lungs, and the heart. heart. The liver actually is the most common form of, um, is the most involved um, in this condition. Then patients could present with facial edema. Then there is a classical triad of the rash, the fever, and the systemic involvement. Now, the, the, the diagnostic uh, criteria, there were actually three main criteria that were talked about. That is the um, regis, um, register criteria, which had parameters um, that included skin eruption, uh, fever, uh, um, fever greater than 38 uh, degrees centigrade, then lymphadenopathy in at least two sites, greater than one centimeter in diameter, then involving at least one internal organ then lymphocytosis of greater than four or lymphopenia of less than 1.5, then blood eosinophilia of greater than 10%, thrombocytopenia um, of less than 120. And at least three of any of this is enough to make a diagnosis. There were other criteria that were um, included for the diagnosis of dress. And it, um, it's the, we have the Japanese uh, group criteria and the Bokwets criteria. criteria. The Since we've lost... Um... That's a joy, any network problem. Yeah, sorry, it was a network. Oh, so right. we have the list of um, predisposing factors. We have genotic, uh, drugs, we have genetic history, then we have uh, infections with virus, where we have that viral uh, reactivation, then also family history of uh, drug reactions. Then also um, HIV could be part of the predisposing factor, which still falls under the uh, viral group. Then now, uh, to outline the clinical features, actually, they have non-specific symptoms, um, which would include fatigue, malaise, fever, pyritis, jaundice. 
Then um, on examination, we can see skin lesions affecting more than 90% of the um, total body area. We have a uh, marked pruritus, uh, fever, lymphadenopathy, neck involvement. And in, in this, in dress, really we have a mucosal involvement. Then now, I, um, the liver, as we said, it presents with hepatitis or fulminant hepatic failure. Uh, the lungs also are affected. Patients can present with pneumonitis, the myocarditis, myocarditis, um, where the heart is, in, um, is uh, affected. Then we ha can have late onset uh, thyroiditis. Um, now, we're meant to list four classes of drugs, but what I did was just to give uh, the drug class, um, drugs that could be involved uh, in dress. We have the anti, anti -micro microbials, ampicillin, dapsin, isoniazid, uh, rifampicin, then anticonvulsants, antiviral drugs, antidepressants, then antihypertensives, then other drugs could be allopurinol, sedicoxib, and omiprazole. Now, to outline the management, a history of um, the use of drugs is very, very important in, in this patient. Then we also need to physically examine the patient for the mobiliform rash. They could also pre present with disquamator um, uh, skin lesions, then also with uh, purples and the uh, erythema. Then uh, when, um, patients, we need to do a full blood count, peripheral blood film, uh, maybe to rule out to do when a patient presents to with you. The first thing to do when a patient presents with dress is to um, find out what drug the patient may have taken and immediately discontinue the drug. Then um, you need to take care of the airway, breathing and circulation of the patient. The patient needs to be managed in the high density unit and there's supportive care. So, Management is largely um, supportive in this patient. And you need to give your fluids, uh, then monitor your input output, then supplemental um, oxygen and nursing care. Next slide, please. Dress involve corticosteroids, which will be topical or intravenous uh, corticosteroid cases. We can give uh, cyclosporine. Then most times we avoid the uh, antibiotics, except we use antibiotics except in established cases of infection. Then we, we need to use emollients for the patient, uh, topical steroids and the uh, intravenous immunoglobulins, then uh, plasma pharesis for the patient. So this is just that I just want to give an overview of um, the drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic syndrome. That's the dress. Now the in introduction. It's a drug-induced hypersensitivity um, syndrome, and with time, if there has been evolving nomenclature, and um, it's recognized as one of the severe cutaneous adverse re re reaction that is potentially life-threatening. And uh, historically, it was linked to phenytoin and initially described as a phenytoin hypersensitivity reaction. But when it was now discovered that there were many other drugs to be implicated in this disease, um, another nomenclature had to be. We also had the drug induced delayed multi organ hypersensitivity syndrome, then the drug induced uh, pseudo lymphoma. This, this name was uh, coined by the fact that when a biopsy was taken from lymph nodes, it was in about 24 patients. It was found that in some minimal uh, portions of the patient that the lymph nodes um, were enlarged, but most of them presented with uh, systemic symptoms. So that was where the name drug reaction uh, dress noun uh, was adopted. 
So um, as we have anticonvulsants most times and the sulfonamides as the most common offenders causing dress. Usually the um, dress syndrome has a latent period of two to six weeks, even lasting up to um, uh, three to four months. And um, the severity of this uh, syndrome actually is related to the amount of systemic, the multi-organ failure we can have in this patient. So most times the most, most important step is for early diagnosis and immediate cessation of um, suspected uh, offending drug. Um, okay, just have... Not much epidemiology has been... Not much epidemiological data have been done on the disease incidence because ecological factors um, that could cause um, breast syndrome um, are likely. Uh, so it's been estimated that the overall risk in the population is between one, um, one in 1,000 to about one in 10,000 uh, patients that are um, exposed to drugs. There is been discovered in that um, with new drug users of phenytoin and carbamazepine, that the, the um, it could be patients. It affects both adults and children, and uh, there could be there is no age or sex uh, predilection. Then now the pathogenesis of dress remains elusive, but genetic factors have have been uh, in, and genetic associations have been in, um, implicated in this uh, 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 disease. Yes, so genetic factors have been implicated in this disease. So we have what well, we have genetic uh, deficiency of the toxifying enzymes uh, leading to accumulating uh, drug metabolites. These drug metabolites actually bind to cell molecule now in, uh, causing a cascade of immunological events. And uh, there could be eosinophilic activation as well as activation of an inflammatory cascade, which is induced by um, interleukin-5 release from drug-specific uh, T cells. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, okay. So then also genetic uh, associations um, where we had the HLA uh, associations have also been postulated, where we, um, with uh, drug um, uh, sensitivity, this may also occur. Then we also have uh, a possible uh, viral drug uh, interaction associated with viral uh, active reactivation. It might also exist, and clinical manifestations usually appear as a result of expansion of virus-specific and uh, non-specific uh, non -specific, uh, cells, T cells. Hello, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so this is just a this is just a slide showing uh, where we have the genetic uh, susceptibility. To um, to dress, then uh, we have the HLA uh, antigens that are involved. We have the HLA B fifty eight O one, then the HLA uh, uh, B fifty seven O one and thirty seven O one. These actually um, cause an increased T cell uh, um, reaction. This actually occurs between two to six weeks after the drug exposure, then uh, leading to dress. Then also where you have
just quickly summarize. Okay. Quickly summarize. Okay. Let's take comments and questions, please. Okay, ma. Okay, ma. So, um, just as I talked talk about the clinical features, um, as we initially mentioned, fever, then um, systemic involvement, and we we can see that um, from this uh, picture, um, it's showing a uh, um, erythematous that's on the A. It's showing erythematous scaly patch with purples on the forearm. Then on the foot, we have the squamation of the uh, soles. And then we can also see uh, the erythematous rash all over um, this patient's uh, skin. Then also the um, histology of the skin will show parakeratosis with intracorneal neutrophil postules as spongiosis and mixed per perivascular, perivascular infiltrates. Now the investigations, as I mentioned, if we need to do a history, uh, full blood count, uh, liver function test, PCR, a serological test for hepatitis and H a human virus, then blood cultures where infections are suspected, imaging, and then, um, please, next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. Blood cultures, um, then uh, imaging, chest x-ray, then biopsy of the lymph nodes, then patch test to confirm the offending drugs, then ECG and echo. There's actually no gold standard there is no gold standard for the diagnosis of uh, dress. It's mainly clinical. So one should actually consider the latency period, diversity of symptoms, and the um, exclusion of similar non-drug uh, um, in, um, induced condition. So we've talked about the score system as proposed by the European Registry of Severe Cutaneous Adverse Reaction Group. And um, this, uh, this is just the diagnostic criteria by Bokwet et al. Then that's the first one. Hello? Yeah, just summarize. Next slide, just go. Yes, next slide. Next okay, slide. next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So we have the criteria listed, the booklet. Okay, I think um, we've lost that again. I think our network has been terrible today. So, uh, Doctor Joy, maybe when she comes, so she will just will just give a contribution. So, if we have any questions, then if the network allows her, then uh, she can respond to those questions and clarification. So, it's time for us to contribute. So, if you have any questions, any clarifications. You can contribute, you can type or you can raise your hand to make your contribution. Any contribution? I know the network was not okay. helpful, but any contributions? Hello? Hello? Yeah, Dr. Joy, just hold. Yeah, so just don't worry. Okay. You drop. Okay. okay, the slide is already, the slides are already on the group. So we just welcome contribution. So if there are any questions or clarifications, so you you respond to them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for presenting. Any contributions, any clarifications? Doctor, Doctor Christopher, I don't know if you have any thing to say. Oh, before we move to the next um, question, seems nobody has any question. Uh, she, she, 
she did a good job really i guess you know for the uh, net uh you know for net for the side were really rich and she the situation was quite lucid i am surprised there are no comments really because she everybody heard what she said so i think there should have been questions and comments from the participants so she did well there's really nothing to add concerning what she said she said everything that should be said that's that Okay. Um, Hello. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you, Doctor Omba, for the presentation. Um. Yeah. I remember this. Um. This particular question. It was one that. Um. In the exam. When I saw it, I had no idea whatsoever. But I'd never even read this before. That was the first time I was reading this in the exam hall. So initially, I was at a loss. But because I usually tell myself that just calm down. So I was calm. So when they asked the first question, um. I didn't I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have an idea. So I said you should ask the next one. Oh, I, so I, I, can I answer this, the next question? When you, so I think I started asking from these factors. So I just started talking about, you know, I just thought of, you know, this, um, the, the question, the, the diagnosis was there already first. Okay, so first drug reaction. So I started thinking of things that can predispose uh, risk factors for possible drug reactions. I think maybe the person has a uh, kidney disease, the CKD, or maybe liver dysfunction. Just I said a few things like that. And before you know it, they uh, started asking me, you know, I started interacting with the examiners, and I was able to see some. Okay. So, why I'm bringing this up is that sometimes in the exams, you might be hit. I know one or two people who went to the exam and that was their first question. They were completely thrown off because they didn't know anything about that question. And it actually affected them. Some of them had to go back to write the exam. But I, too, I didn't know anything about the question. So I was still able to calm down. And in fact, because the next question in that same station was um, snake bites. So, by the time I know I didn't do, do I didn't do so well in this question, but the snake bite I say have I known at this one. So I did very well in that one. So but if I'd been thrown off with the initial question that I didn't know much about, I might not have been able to answer the next question very well. So I'm just bringing it up to encourage us that sometimes in the exams you might see a question that is, that looks like ah hey, there's trouble. Here. Don't worry, just calm down. Say whatever you can and move on. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the contribution. <coughs> Dr. Fee, yes, thank you. For that. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I forgot to mention Dr. Joy, thank you so much. That was a, a wonderful presentation. I your slide out this they are so rich to show that you did your research. So I say thank you. Thank you so much. Please quickly share your slides so that um, the participant can take a look at it, please. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Faye is saying uh, the diagnostic criteria. Okay. Um, she gave a pneumonia, H-LAF, H-LAF, H -laf, H -l -a -f -i, okay. H for hematological abnormalities, L for lymphopathy, A for acute rash, F for fever, and I for internal um, organ development. Okay, um, Dr. Hifford, are you in class? Dr. Hifford, I know he was ready yesterday to present. It's just time that he didn't allow us. Dr. Hifford, are you around? Oh, Dr. Mustafa, are you ready for a presentation? Yes, sir. Can I share my screen? 
นะครับอะไรอย่างฮัลโหลอิสเซ่ Yes I'm ready Sam Okay then go ahead since I'm here for this not <clears throat> It's not around. I don't think it's in class. It's in class. I thought you it's in class. Okay. Okay. So he's not saying anything. I know he was ready yesterday to present. So I don't know what's. Oh. Okay, Mustafa. Hello, Mustafa, sir. Let's go Please, ahead. I'm around. So I'm around. Okay. Please, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Can you hear All me, right. sir? So, yes, we can hear you. Can you quickly share your slides so that we take your question? Please, can you see my slide? Not yet. Uh, so please, can you share it for me, please? Okay, can you drop drop it on uh, on the yes, WhatsApp I group? So that, um, I got it this morning, Mustafa. sir. Okay, Mustafa, can you help him share? It? Okay, so I will do that. Oh. Mm -hmm. Doctor Hayford. Yes, sir. After the class, just reach out to me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Good yes, morning, yes, teachers. Good morning, consultants. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I'm here for Dieti from Accra, Ghana, Kolibu Teaching Hospital. Um, I'll be attempting West Africa General Medicine recall October 2021, uh, question two. Please, next slide, sir. A scenario of a farmer who was walking along the footpath and then a picture of a swollen foot with blisters. The questions are, what is the diagnosis? Or question two, mention five other symptoms patient can present with. Question three, list uh, five investigations you will do for this patient. Question four, list five complications. Question five, how will you manage this patient in the emergency room? So we have, please next slide, sir. We have a, a patient who is a, a, a farmer walking by the footpath and then he has a swollen foot with blisters. So my diagnosis would be a snake bite with local envenomation because there are blisters already, which shows that there is some cytotoxicity going on already. And the moment you have a cytotoxicity or envenomation locally, there is a possibility of a systemic envenomation. Next question, sir. Um, it's a mention five other symptoms that the patient will present with. So you can have local symptoms like painful leg swelling, bleeding from fan marks, ulceration. You can have darkening of the digits or the limb. Also, you have GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, hypersalivation, metallic taste. You have a hematotoxicity that presents as bleeding from other sides, epistasis, gum bleeding, um, hematemesis, hematuria, subconjunctiva, hemorrhage. You also have dark urine with oliguria, and then we have pencil, painful muscles as a result of rhabdomyolysis. We also have dizziness, palpitation, and light tiredness from either hypotension or the cardiotoxicity. You can have dyspnea from respiratory muscle paralysis or um, pulmonary edema. Also, ptosis, diplopia, dysarthria, and dysphagia as a result of neurotoxicity. Next slide, please. It's at least five investigations you will do. So the first thing to do is um, whole blood clotting test. If the blood is able to clot within 20 minutes, it means that uh, the coagulation system is working well. If it's more than 20 minutes and the blood is not clotting, it means that there's severe reduction of fibrinogen in the blood. Full blood count usually have leukocytosis, uh, anemia, and then thrombocytopenia. The clotting profile, you have high INRPT and APTT. Usually repeat it after every six hours 
to see if your patient is worsening or is getting better. Blood urea, electrolyte, and creatinine. We have elevated urea and creatinine as a result of the acute kidney injury from either the hypotension or the BIC or the rhabdomyolysis. Uh, Unilysis to see myoglobinuria and hematuria from the myoglobin. Uh, rhabdomyolysis or the acute uh, kidney injury. ECG, usually they may have bradyarrhythmia, or tachyarrhythmia. So you look for arrhythmias in the ECG. And then chest X-ray for pulmonary edema. If they come with any symptoms of reduced sens uh, sensorium or uh, focal neurological symptoms, you can do a CT scan of the brain to look for intracranial hemorrhage. Next slide, please. So list five complications. So the complication may be related to the site of bite where you can develop gangrene of the limb. They can have infected wound with sepsis and then compartment syndrome can also occur. Acute kidney injury can occur. DIC can occur. And then hypotension or shock can occur as a result of either cardiogenic shock or hypovolemic shock from bleeding and vomiting. Respiratory failure and then anaphylaxis from the envenomation itself and then we can also have the serum sickness uh, uh, syndrome. So that one too can be from the anti snake venom that is going to be given. Next slide, please. How will you manage this patient in the emergency room? Principles of management will be multidisciplinary. We need the emergency physician, the medical toxicologist, they know the snakes and which type of Anti venoms will be very good for, for us. Pharmacists to provide, to provide the anti snake venom, the nurses, laboratory scientists for the laboratory work, and the hematologists for the DIC. Infectious disease, in case we have super infection, nephrologists for the AKI, pulmonologists, ICU, uh, specialist, and then surgeon, in case we have to do debridement or fasciotomy or an amputation for the uh, gangrenous uh, leg. The uh, primary survey to check the airway to uh, breathing and then circulation, the airway to prevent uh, any form of uh, airway obstruction that will lead to hypoxia, and then the breathing to be sure that there is no hypercapnia, circulation to be sure that there is no shock or hypotension, and then to be able to resuscitate the patient adequately. Uh, we'll take a brief history and examination. The history is just to be sure that we identify the particular uh, snake. We are not supposed to bring the snake, but if they are able to take a, a picture, it will help us. Then also to see how many uh, bites the patient had and where the bites are, find whether they are local, uh, sim the symptoms that the patient presents with, and then also uh, systemic symptoms and the comorbidities that the patient has. We'll find out from that. Then we also give uh, analgesia. It is preferable that you give IV opiates. We don't want injections, uh, intramuscular injections, and also we don't want incest because of the coagulopathy. It can worsen the uh, platelet dysfunction. Then we minimize uh, local tissue damage. Please, can you go on, sir? Next slide. Um, so let's go on, sir. This is the primary survey. Can you let's go on, sir? History, we have done that, sir. Analgesia. Okay, please, back. Sir, back, sir. Okay, minimize local tissue damage. So we avoid tonicase. It is actually dangerous to apply tonicase. The only time you can use a tonicase is if you have an elapid uh, bite and you are going to get to the hospital in more than 30 minutes, uh, but less than three hours. In that case, you can apply it every 15 minutes and then release for 30 seconds, but not too much to compress the arterial supply. The reason is that when you apply too much, you are likely to worsen the local envenomation and lead to worsening of the local uh, 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 problems, uh, tissue damage. We also don't want to cut near the site or suck the wound. So we wash the wound and there's bite marks with soap and water. We clean it and dry, uh, cover it dry. And then it's supposed to be elevated. The limb is supposed to be elevated or at least keep at heart level and not uh, hang down because if you hang down, it's going to worsen the local envenomation. Next slide, sir. Anti snake venom. Uh, the, the indications of giving an anti snake venom is when there is envenomation, either it's local envenomation, severe local envenomation, or systemic envenomation, or laboratory uh, tests show that 
there is systemic envenomation, as in the race, uh, this fibrino, uh, they have hypofibrinogenemia, I raise INR, I, uh, PT, P, APTT, and PT. And then also the clotting is not, uh, the blood is not clotting after 20 minutes. Next slide, sir. The kind of, the dosage of drugs given would depend on the severity of the snake envenomation. If there is no envenomation, we don't give any anti-snake venom. If there is a mild envenomation, you give five vials. Each vial is 10 mils. So five vials would give 50 mils. Uh, moderate envenomation, we give 10 vials, and then severe envenomation, we give 15 vials. We will see the types of the severity of envenomation very soon in the literature review. Uh, you dilute every uh, snake, anti snake venom uh, vial by 5 mil per kilogram of isotonic saline, uh, or 5% dextrose, before you administer. And it's administered slowly over one to two hours. You can repeat this after one to two hours if there is evidence that the symptoms are not improving, or after six hours, there is evidence that the blood is still incoagulable. Next slide, please. Specific therapy for other systemic toxicities will be if you have hematologic uh, hematotoxicity, you can give uh, FFPs, cryoplatyspates, or platelet concentrates. If there is acute kidney injury, we hydrate and if it's not uh, resolving or it's worsening, it can dialyze the patient. Respiratory failure, we give, in, we can intubate the patient, and then we can give that we can use the tensile test to uh, see whether the neuromuscular blockage is going to improve. We give IV atropine 0.6 milligram, followed by IV adrofonium 10 milligram. And if it's able to uh, help with the respiration, we now put on the maintenance of neostigmine, about 550 to 100 microgram per kilogram body weight, and as well as atropine. A supportive treatment will be tetanus prophylaxis. We have to inquire about the patient's immunization status. To give tetanus prophylaxis, we need two things. What is the state of the wound? Is it a clean wound? Is it a dirty wound? And then is the patient fully vaccinated or not? Fully vaccinated means that they have at least three vas uh, vas uh, tetanus toxoid uh, injections in the past. So if the patient is fully vaccinated and the wound is clean uh, and the vaccination is within 10 years, you don't give any, anything at all. No human immuno no immunoglobulin, no tetanus toxoid. But if there's, it's more than 10 years, you can give the tetanus toxoid. If the wound is dirty and the patient is fully vaccinated and it's more than five years, you can give uh, a tetanus toxoid, but then no immunoglobulin. Um, if the wound is clean, but the patient is not fully vaccinated, or we don't know, you give the tetanus toxoid, no immunoglobulin. But if the wound is dirty and the patient has been, we don't know the patient's vaccination status or it's not fully vaccinated, then we give the immunoglobulin and then the tetanus toxoid. Um, antibiotics is controversial. Studies done in um, Brazil and Sri Lanka shows that prophylactic antibiotics is not, uh, is, it doesn't work. So the, 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 the way we manage it is that we wait to see whether there is any established infection. And that if you are able to see established infection, that one you can use the antibiotics and you culture um, the organism and then see which antibiotics they are sensitive to. Um, surgical care, we can do debridement when the wound is inf infected or is becoming necrotic. And then also fasciotomy, if you have uh, the compartment syndrome, it can amputate the patient's leg, which we don't want. And that is why we like to do the uh, early treatment and then the anti-snake venom um, infusion earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, sir. Okay, so before we discharge the patient, we have to educate the patient. We have to, uh, most times, the uh, patient who are beaten for about 20% uh, about on average, 19 to 32% have what we call dry bites, which means that there will be nothing that is happening, uh, no envenomation. And so this patient can be observed from for up to 24 hours and then discharge home. But when they are discharged home, we have to educate them that they have to avoid bearing weight. Uh, and then also 
try to educate to avoid uh, bites of, uh, or snake bites by wearing protective clothing, avoid placing their hands and feet in places they cannot see, and also leave snakes alone. It's been said that if the snake is even dead, it can still be envenomate to you. So whether it's dead or it's alive, leave the snakes alone. And then make sure that wherever you are going, the place is lighted. We educate the patient about serum sickness syndrome, which is a reaction, type three hypersensitivity reaction that occurs after anti-snake venom has been given about five to 24 days later. And so we have to let them know that when they have those symptoms, they have to come back. And then there's also a report of relapse of, uh, of symptoms after or delayed envenomation symptoms after the patient has been beaten. And so whenever they are having symptoms again, they have to come back. This is the way we educate the patient before we discharge them. Thank you. I want to go to just a few, uh, an overview. Um, snake bite is an injury caused by a bite of a snake resulting from in puncture wounds inflicted by the animal fangs and sometimes result in envenomation. About 5.5 million people are bitten by snakes every year and about 20,000 to 94,000 of people die each year from snake bites. A largely neglected problem of rural tropics actually occurs more in the poor settings and among children and then uh, farm farmers. Next slide, please. The snake venoms are highly variable and complex mixtures of enzymes and low molecular weight polypeptides. And they are injected through special channels or grooves to called fangs. And whenever these are re released, they have proteolytic enzymes that are capable of breaking down proteins and myotoxins that are capable of destroying muscles. They also have neurotoxins that bind to uh, acetylcholine receptors and prevent and lead to a lot of um, neurotoxic, neurotoxicity in the central nervous system. Next slide, please. So the ultimate toxicity also depends on certain features, the snake features and then the human features. What are the, um, si what is the size of the snake? What is the state of health? What are the wound characteristics? And then the uh, venom quantity and the potency that has been released. In terms of the snake features, we know that if the patient has elliptical head, uh, if the, the, the snake has elliptical head and slit like pupils, and then have a rattle tail, these patients and a heat sensing pit, these uh, snakes are likely to be more venomous. The others are not likely to be venomous. Next slide, please. So on the left side of the slide, you see the venomous snakes, they have a triangular shaped head, and then they have elliptical pupils, and then they have a, a, a rattle tail. These are the ones that are venomous. The round heads and then the round pupils, and then the inner plate ones are not likely to be venomous. Next slide, please. So venomous snakes are into four families. There are a lot of snakes, but only four families are venomous. The majority of the snakes are colibris. Uh, the colibri, they have many uh, 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 species, but only a few of them are uh, venomous. Then we have the Atractas pididae, the elapids, which are the uh, cobras, and then the viperides, which are the vipers. These are the ones that are toxic to humans. Next slide, please. The common ones in sub-Saharan Africa are carpet viper, the puff adder, the spitting cobra, the black mamba, and the bull slang, which we call the tree, the tree snake. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of pathophysiology, we have a snake bite. When the snake bites, it uh, releases venom into the, the skin. Now, the, what happens to the patient depends on the type of venom that has been released because the venoms contain specialized proteolytic enzymes and toxins that can cause certain uh, complications. When they release enzymes that are able to break uh, the, the skin, they lead to dermatonecrosis. And those that are able to invade uh, the muscles lead to myonecrosis. So you see something like the crotalidase, they come with uh, metalloproteinases, collagenases, phospholipase, and then hyaluronidases. Uh, serum proteases, disintegrins, and C-type lactin proteins lead to the hematologic uh, side effects and coagulopathy. 
And then the majority of toxin uh, leads to inhibition of the presynaptic acetylcholine release and lead to the paralysis. Just like most of the LRPs that release neurotoxins, they lead to acetylcholine uh, inhibition. And that is why they lead to all those uh, complications. Next slide, please. So in terms of the complications, you can have cytotoxicity. Next slide, please. Myotoxicity. You can have neurotoxicity. Next slide, please. Hematotoxicity, based on the kind of uh, venom that they are released. Next slide, please. Cardiotoxicity. This one usually is the vipers and the LRPs. They can lead to the damage of the myocardium, leading to arrhythmias. They can have brady or tachyarrhythmias, and then lead to also hypotension. Next slide, please. And then myotoxicity. Usually the cyst snake, it releases its venoms and leads to rhabdomyolysis. Next slide, please. Nephrotoxicity, most venoms are renally restricted. And so at the end of the day, you can have either vasculitis in the glomerular capillaries, interstitial glomerular nephritis, tubular damage, or acutinal necrosis secondary to ischemia. Next slide, please. Now, this is the severity table of envenomation. It depends on three things, local envenomation, systemic envenomation, and then coagulation that is found in the laboratory exams. So if you have severe local envenomation, it becomes severe. If there is none, there is minimal. If there is systemic envenomation that is severe, you also have severe envenomation. So it depends on the severity of the local envenomation, systemic envenomation, and then the coagulopathy you find. The more you have these complications, the more severe the patient becomes. And then the, it will depend, it will determine the vials, the amount of vials you use of the anti-snake venom. Next slide, please. So investigations we've gone through already, full blood count, whole blood protein, and then the ECG, urinalysis, DE and creatinine. Ultrasound of the limb is only indicated if you are suspicious that there is a DVT or the patient has gone into either compartment syndrome. You want to see if the vessels are still um, uh, working. And then wound swab is very important because we don't want to prophylactically give antibiotics because studies have shown that they don't work. Next slide, please. Okay, management uh, is multidisciplinary airway, breathing, circulation. We need a wide ball cannula. We don't want small cannulas because the patient can really vomit. It can go into shock. It can have a bleeding diastasis that will lead to uh, coagulopathy DIC. So we need wide ball cannulas, uh, but we don't want the cannula to be at places that we cannot compress, especially like the subclavian or the jugular, because they can really bleed from any puncture site. And that is why we prefer the anticubital fossa or the wrist, where you can easily uh, compress. Um, fluid resuscitation is a very important. Crystalloids, colloids. When we have started with crystalloids and colloids and the patient is not improving, then we can use 5% salt poor albumin. Um, inotropes are only used after as this snake venom has been given. And adequate resuscitation fields. We don't typically use inotropes in the absence of... Um, and then anti-snake venom indications, we have said it is a stroke... Uh, severe, uh, any form of envenomation, either systemic or local, or there is laboratory evidence that there is envenomation, even with the absence of clinical signs, we give anti-snake venom. Those requirements is, as, is uh, when there's no envenomation, you don't give any. When there is uh, uh, envenomation, mild, you give five vials. When there's moderate, 10 vials. When there's severe, you give 15 vials. You can repeat after one to two hours if there the symptoms are not improving. Next slide, please. So response to anti-snake venom, it is really rapid and dramatic. Usually neurotoxicity signs improve within 30 minutes, even though it can take several hours. So if after 30 minutes, the patient is not improving within one hour or two hours, you have to repeat another dose of the anti-snake venom. Also bleeding stops usually within 15 to 30 minutes. Hypersensitivity reactions to the anti-snake venom. This is very important. There are three anti uh, hypersensitivity reactions to anti-snake venom. The first is what we call the early reaction, and that is an IgE-mediated uh, anaphylactic shock. It comes between 10 to eight, 180 minutes of therapy. It presents as anaphylactic, uh, a, a itching, uh, nausea, vomiting, cough, abdominal 
colic, uh, fever, and tachycardia. They may also have hypotension. About 40% of patients who have an early reaction will have hypotension. They have bronchospasm and angioedema. Then the next step is called a pyrogenic reaction. This one occurs about one hour to two hours after you have given the artistic venom. And then we have the next one. This one, the pyrogenic reaction, they usually present with fever, chills, and rigors, like um, a malaria-like syndrome. Um, the, the last uh, reaction is called the late reaction, the starium sickness re uh, syndrome. This one is usually a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction and usually occurs after uh, 5 to 24 days. So it may be the patient may be discharged. And it's a presents with a triad of fever, joint pains, and a rash. And so these are very, very important to educate the patient when you are discharging them. Next slide, please. So in management of anti-snake venom reaction, the first thing you do is you stop the anti-snake venom, you give IV saline, IV adrenaline, IV hydrocortisone, and IV antihistamine. We don't want to give IMs because of the coagulopathy can lead to bleeding. When the reaction is controlled, you restart the anti-snake venom. Uh, but this time you may decide to dilute it more than the first one. And then make sure that you also uh, stay under stay there and then see the patient through. Um, because of this, some people think that you can give anti-snake as a test dose and also may give a pre-medication as before you give. Uh, from studies, it's been seen that you don't really give uh, the, you, you don't really give anti-snake venom as a test dose because if the patient will react, it will not be as a result of the test dose. Uh, you may not see it after the test dose. So uh, usually we don't give test dose anti-snake venom. The other thing is that the pre-medication is also not shown to improve any uh, condition. Yeah, so the experts don't uh, recommend giving pre-medication of hydrocort or adrenaline before you give the anti-snake venom. Next slide, please. Supportive treatment. Tetanus prophylaxis, very important. The infection uh, of the wound may come from the patient, the, the patient's uh, own uh, risk factors. Either they put herbs on it, or they try to put sand around the place, or they may try to cut or, or try to infiltrate the area. These are the things that can introduce infection into the wound. And then also the, the snakes, uh, Oral uh, flora uh, itself can actually give you the uh, infection of the wound. And so when there is infection of the wound, we culture and then we can now start antibiotics. <laughs> Surgical debridement, when there is dead or dying tissues, and then Hello, sir. Yeah, we can hear you. Um... Okay, so next slide, please. So uh, in terms of hematostatic disturbance, we give the FFB carb precipitate and platelet concentrate, renal failure, we give dialysis as well as hydration. Next slide, please. So education, as you say, is very important that we educate the patient because they can have symptoms after uh, they have gone back, and also because we want to prevent them having uh, another snake bite. So these are the education we give to the patient. So in summary, next slide, please. Next slide, please, sir. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hayford. So thank you for a lucid and very wonderful presentation. Thank you. So, uh, Time for contribution for the little time we have before you know the end of the class. Um, okay, so from the chat box, okay, Dr. Blessing, Dr. Just, um, I have presentation. Um, Dr. Alecon said the uh, indication for doing the pain CT scan in patient with snake bite. Indication for the CT scan in patient with snake bites. Um, so, Dr. Rukaya, 
first dose of anti snake venom needs to be given before the full dose because of the risk of an okay yes you you mentioned different school of thoughts uh, regarding this both um, pre medication and um, giving a test okay uh, dr Marty, this, do you 15 vials at once in severe and venom are there different formulation of anti snake venom Okay, please, can you throw more lights on the tensile test? Okay. So those are the three questions on the chat box. So, effort. Uh, in the of brain CT, do you give all the 15 valves for severe inflammation or their different formulation? And then, uh, right, so, so, can you quickly answer? And then, okay, before. Whoa. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, my teachers and colleagues. Thank you very much. So uh, in terms of CT scan, we don't uh, usually do CT scan, but you order a CT scan if the patient comes with a reduced consciousness because the, anti the snake venom does not actually cross the blood-brain barrier. So if the patient comes with reduced consciousness, uh, have a, a neurological deficit, which is a focal, then you may be thinking that there's bleeding in the brain. So you look at the clinical scenario and you examine the patient, and then you have to think that this is because there may be a potential bleed in the brain because of the coagulopathy. And that is when you order a CT scan, but usually we don't do that. The next is that are there different formulations of uh, anti-snake venom? Yes, please. We have uh, monovalent and then polyvalent. So monovalent snake, anti-snake venom is a snake, uh, anti-snake venom that uh, has been constituted from only one uh, species of snakes. And then uh, polyvalent is when you have two or more snakes uh, venom that have been used to constitute the anti-snake venom. Sometimes if you don't know the type of snake that has bitten the patient, you prefer the polyvalent than the monovalent. Um, and then also whether you can give 15 vials at a go. Yes, please. You can give 15 vials, but you don't give it as a bolus. You give it in an infusion. So you dilute it, and then you run it over one to two hours. And it doesn't matter whether the patient is a child or an adult. That's how you do it, to be able to uh, prevent the, uh, the complications that come from systemic envenomation or local envenomation. It's only anti-snake venom that can mop up the venom in the system. Thank you, please. Hello, sir. Yeah, uh, yes, you are audible. Okay, uh, Chief Okodoma, since Dr. Tanimu is not saying anything, okay. Okay, good morning, everybody, colleagues. Well done, well done very much. Um, wonderful presentation. I just want to quickly add, um, ask a few questions and um, just, I don't know whether I did not hear them well. So to the presenter, well done, sir. So I just want to ask, um, you know, what are those groups of um, snake bites that you mentioned? What are the groups again? Um, like Viperidae, can you list them again? So when you list them, can you tell us which one of when the venom is absorbed, which one is absorbed slowly, which one is absorbed rapidly, you know, which one causes more cardiotoxic effect, neurotoxic effect, which one has more hemorrhagic effect, which one just is just cytotoxic, you know, like it's just cytotoxic effect that they have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ma. Um, so we have uh, four families of snakes that are venomous among all of them. And they are the elapids, the, uh, the uh, cotalides, mm -hmm. the viperides, and then the attractive spiridae. So these are the ones that uh, do have uh, venomation. And generally, the elapids are neurotoxic. 
and then the vipiridase days are generally hem hematotoxic. And uh, these are the ones that uh, uh, we can see. Having said that, some can have both hematotoxic, uh, cytotoxic, and then the uh, neurotoxic uh, features. Um, the crotalis are usually cytotoxic and then uh, also hematotoxic, more myotoxic. And so more than cytotoxic and myotoxic. So those are the crotalides are usually cytotoxic and myotoxic. While the elapidase are usually uh, neurotoxic and then the vipiridase are usually uh, hematotoxic and also cardiotoxic. Okay, very good. So let, let's, let me just elaborate a bit. So the elapidase, so we start from the very terrible ones. <clears throat> so the elapidase, they are rapidly absorbed into the circulation, and that is why they cause all these um, problems. So they are rapidly absorbed into the circulation, and they are, like you said, they are neurotoxic, cardiotoxic, and also, they also spit into the eyes, you, you know? So elapidase, the venoms are polypeptides, they are rapidly absorbed into the circulation, they cause non-depolarizing blocks, so they can cause flaccid paralysis of the respiratory muscles, and that's how they cause the death of their victims. So they cause little or no local swelling at the site of the bite. Do you understand? As distinct from most of the other ones that you see swelling. So because their own effect is mainly into the system, so they cause non-depolarizing block and cause flaccid paralysis of the respiratory muscles. So, and you know, yes, the cobras are inside this elapidase. So they, the spitting cobras can spit into the eyes and cause damage. And those damage yes, can be, range from cornea ulceration, keratoconjunctivitis, and that can cause permanent damage to the cornea and blindness, especially if there's yes, secondary bacterial infection. So the other things that is very important to this elapidase group is that they are neurotoxic and they are cardiotoxic. So that means they can come with hypotension, arrhythmias, ECG abnormalities, raised cardiac enzymes. For the neurotoxic effect, they can have tosis, diplopia, cranial nerve pulses, excessive salivation, dysphagia, dysatria from bulba, paralysis. And they can also have paralysis of the skeletal and smooth muscles. And like we have said, that's how they cause their respiratory paralysis, which is the cause of death. So that is a lapidate. It is like the worst form of the snake bite. Now, the vipiridase, they are, the venoms are usually absorbed relatively slowly via the lymphatics. So they cause severe local swelling and tissue damage. So these are very important because when they give you the scenario in the exam, it can tell you by the time they give you uh, maybe a picture of somebody that has severe local swelling on the leg or somewhere, I know, you know, you can know that, okay, this is most likely a vipiridae. As distinct from, they don't give you um, tissue damage but they tell you there are neurotoxic effect or cardiotoxic effect or um, eye effect, okay? So you know that those would be elapidase. So vipiridase are, because um, vipiridase are relatively slowly absorbed and they are absorbed through the lymphatics. So they cause severe local swelling and tissue damage. Now, um, examples, just like the name says, viparidase. So examples under them are the carpet. Um, vipers, okay? So um, what else? They cause hemorrhagic effects too. Um, the hemorrhagic effects can be into the gums, the GI to the brain, and then they can have incoagulable blood, which you have explained, with persistent bleeding from the site of the trauma. So the, so the major things that they have are hemorrhagic effects and cytotoxic effects. And the cytotoxic effects will be massive local swelling, blistering, necrosis. They can form bullying. Okay, so that is vipiridae. They absorb slowly. They have a lot of cytotoxic effect and hemorrhagic effect. However, lapidase are absorbed rapidly. They have neurotoxic effect, cardiotoxic effect, effects on the eye if it is the spitting cobras, but less or no um, cytotoxic, cytotoxic effect. So you have the hydrophidase. Those are the ones, the snakes in the water. Okay, those ones, they can cause renal failure, acute renal failure. They cause um, painful muscles, so they can have myoglobinuria, they can have stiff, painful muscles. They can present with trismus. 
okay? So usually they are on because you know when you were talking, you mentioned that the symptoms can be delayed too. So these adrophides, they are the ones that the symptoms can occur hours to 60 hours after the um, bites of the of the snake. So most of the symptoms that they'll present it with the tender, stiff muscles, muscle paralysis, and it can also affect the respiration, mild globinuria that can lead to acute renal failure. And so it's important to check the potassium so that they don't die from cardiac arrest. So the final one I'm going to mention are the colubridae. Um, these ones are also hemorrhagic, just like the viperidae. So they can cause continuous bleeding and they can cause DIC. So let me just quickly recap again. The four um, that is here, and I'm reading from um, a compendium of clinical medicine by Falashi and Akuki, Akikube, are the viperidase, elapidase, hydrophidase, and the colubridase. And elapidase are um, the most severe, rapidly absorbed, neurotoxic, cardiotoxic, venomous spit into the eye. Vipridase are slowly absorbed, more cytotoxic, severe cytotoxic effects and hemorrhagic effects. Hemorrhagic effects are also seen in the colubridase, but the hydrophidase are the ones that have delayed reactions and they cause um, myoglobinuria leading to renal failure, trismus, painful muscles. Okay, I just said I should add that. So wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ma. Yeah. Very much contribution. Thank you. Uh, let me look at. Let me read from the chat box so that. Uh, okay. Okay. Doctor, you don't have picture shown. Doctor Ekele is saying the forest cover is prevalent in the southern part of Nigeria. Naja Meluka. Okay. Uh, let's say, how do you manage uh, serum? Uh, he said, if there's a reaction to the antivenom, do you still continue the infusion? I think he mentioned we'll stop the, and then um, give, and after that, you can dilute the. You can recommend by diluting and then uh, also increase the duration of infusion. Uh, so the infusion is slower than the initial started. Um, what? Okay, this guy also. So, so I think that Jamila wants clarification on how to manage serum sickness. I think that's 32. Just, Hello, sir. Yes. Please. Do you get Am I audible? Hello. Yeah. Okay, sir. So, um, serum sickness uh, is also an, a, a type three hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, usually, the use of antihistamine may shorten the the illness, uh, the duration. Um, in severe cases, you may use corticosteroids, and so those are the till, uh, those are the ones that I know about: uh, antihistamines and corticosteroids. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any other? Doctor, yes, ma'am. I think you know that I've summarized everything. Um, it's past eight already. Most of us already have other activities we want to do. So I must appreciate both speakers, Dr. Joy, Dr. Hayford. Wonderful presentations from both of them. Show sure they did uh, their homework. Thank you so much. Your slides were so rich. Dr. Hayford, Dr. Joy, please share your slides immediately, please. Then any other additions that any uh, class mentioned, please just include okay. them on the slide. Thank you so much, Dr. Atta. Thank you. I must appreciate our teachers, the participants. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank I think you. because of the time already, we'll just close the class. We'll meet again tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Ma